Good afternoon. Nice to be here. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah, I prefer to speak like this rather than with a microphone, if that's okay. Um, so, the title, Three Biggest Mistakes, a little bit tongue-in-cheek when Mac phoned me up a little while ago and said, what do you want to talk about? I need somebody to talk about property investing. Um, and he said, what about, you know, three or four or five mistakes? I'm like, Matt, I've made thousands of mistakes. Um, but he said, can you just kind of uh, whittle it down to a short amount? So who's made more than three mistakes in your career and business life? Probably uh, everybody, if we're, if we're honest. OK, so I've picked three. Um, I'm cheating a little bit on the first one because there's actually four mistakes. Um, and at the end, I'm going to tell you about a personal mistake that I made that cost me £3.1 million. Pounds in lost profit and that was painful and it still hurts and it's actually to, something to do with our headline sponsors who are here today as well all right so I'll, I'll tell you about that at the end of uh, at the end of the day no hard feelings if there's anyone from purple bricks yes wonderful uh, nothing against you guys i think what you're doing is awesome i just missed out on an opportunity that i'm kicking myself for to this day um okay so um that's a little bit about the the sort of talk my background for those of you that don't know anybody heard me if I sent you to sleep before somewhere else uh, speaking, not too many, that's good. Um, so I left school at 16 uh, in Bournemouth with no qualifications. I went to Winton Boys School, so I'm a local lad. Um, my dad was a professional football player. He played for, for Bournemouth for many years. Um, and my mum was this crazy French hairdresser that um, had this hairdressing shop on, on Winton High Street uh, on Wimborne Road. Um, so I grew up around here, had very little confidence, had no idea what I wanted to do when I left school, and I wandered into a career into outdoor pursuits. Loved it, loved seeing kids and adults doing climbing, rock climbing, all that sort of stuff. Really enjoyed it, but at the age of 24, I had an entrepreneurial seizure, and I thought, I don't want to work for anybody else anymore. I want to be my own boss, and I want to forge my path. So I teamed up with a business partner. Um, most of you have seen uh, Go Ape, the treetop adventure trails or centre parks. Um, well, my company, my business partner, we started building those ropes courses in 1994. The first company in Europe to really be building them professionally. Uh, right idea, right time, a lot of hard work. That was 94. By 2001, I was a millionaire on paper, at a uh, ripe old age of 30. Uh, we had 60 staff, biggest company in Europe. If you've ever been to centre parks, we bought all of their climbing walls and treetop adventure trails. Uh, and everything was going well. I lived over in Swanage at that time. I uh, had a five bedroom house overlooking the sea, brand new convertible car, you know, sitting pretty thinking, you have an idea, you start a business, work hard, make a million and you're sorted for the rest of your life. Uh, wasn't that easy, unfortunately. Um, damn shame. Um, two things happened. So you probably remember September the 11th, 2001, terror attacks in New York. Um, we had a lot of companies sending graduates and managers for training. Uh, got lots of phone calls saying we're cancelling our contracts. And you remember foot and mouth disease in the early 2000s? Our construction teams couldn't go onto farmland to actually build anything. And if you don't build anything, as most of you know in property, you don't, you've got nothing to sell, you don't get paid. Um, the net result was I lost everything. I lost my house. Uh, I didn't go, I came back that far away from going personally bankrupt. And the thing that stopped me going from being bankrupt was the fact I bought a house at the right time, early 90s, added value to it, lived in it, it went up in value quite significantly. And I was able to sell that and pay off my debts. And that gave me some working capital to sort of move forward. So 2002, I'm in a three bedroom rented bungalow in Poole with a newborn baby um, and my wife, who's still with me 26 years later, God bless her. Um, just thinking, you know, good job, Mr. Bolton, provider of the family. You screwed it up royally, lost everything, got to start all over again. Um, but I'm a great believer if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. Um, I learned some lessons. I learned about, um, you know, I, I kind of got lucky and I decided, or I had this one thought, which has got to be people in business that have been successful that can teach me how to avoid mistakes. And that's really what I did. I started reading books, going on courses, speaking to successful property investors, just spending time with people that had been successful to see what I could learn from them. Um, and then I started building a small portfolio of um, buy-to-let properties in the local area in Bournemouth and Poole in 2004. Uh, who knows what an HMO is? HMO, most about half of you. Um, if you don't, it's a house in multiple occupancy, okay, where multiple people live. But rather than doing um, student kind of letting, I was a, a very early adopter in professional letting. So young working professional people. If you've ever seen, this, seen the TV show Friends with Joey and Monica and Chandler, the way they live together, um, sharing a flat is kind of what I was doing. So I started doing that fairly quickly from 2004 to 2007, built a six million pound portfolio, about 20 houses and flats in the local area that I still own today. Um, 
and they produced a very nice income, about 15%, um, 15 return on capital invested, about 11 to 12% gross yield, for those of you that know what, what gross yield is. So very, so comparatively, I was making about three times more income per property than the average buy-to-let investor that averages sort of four, four to 5%. So it was a nice model. Um, and then in 2006, my accountant was going through my figures and he was like, how the bloody hell do you make so much money from buy to let? I've got all these other people, they've got flats, they rent them out, they've got a tenant in there, but they're not getting anywhere near the level of income and profit. So I explained my model um, and long story short, he said I should franchise my business. Um, I franchised my business in um, 2007 because I don't, I don't know about you, I don't like debt. I don't want to get lots and lots and lots and lots of debt. And I got to a level where I had mortgages, but I didn't just want to keep buying more and more. Don't trust banks. I hope there's no bankers in the room today. But um, you know, bankers are your great friend when the economy is going well, but when it's going bad. Um, so I decided to diversify my risk, teach other people what I was doing, get a franchise fee, get a small percentage of the ongoing income, um, but help them build their own portfolios. And that's really what Platinum Property Partners done since 2007. We've been going for 10 years. We've gone through a financial crisis. We own now over a thousand properties all over the country, uh, about a 300 million pound portfolio. And we've helped 400 other families generate a lifelong income um, from their own property. So four, five, six, seven, eight houses will make 50 to 150 grand a year net profit if it's done in the right way. Um, so that's really been my journey. Um, and a bit like, with, I guess, with Monopoly, you start off buying houses and then you move on to hotels. So we now own hotels in Bournemouth. We now own serviced offices, um, some retail premises in Salisbury and, and that type of thing. Um, but the main thing we do is help other people build their own um, property portfolio. OK, so that's a, a little bit of background. So I kind of lost everything. I've been through that. And whenever I speak to people, I have, um, you know, there's no disrespect. You don't, I'm not saying you have to lose your house to be to get my respect. But actually, for people that have been through crap and, and had businesses that have failed in America, they say the average millionaire loses everything three times before they finally learn enough about how to hold on to it for, for the long term. So I don't plan to lose it three times. I've done it once. I don't want to go back there. And what I hope and why I speak and why I write books and, and do that sort of stuff quite often is because I love sharing my knowledge. And if I can just help one person avoid any of the mistakes that I've made, then happy days, you know, as far as I'm concerned. I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm here to impart information and hang around and answer any questions at the end. OK, so let's just uh, whiz through. So as I say, um, Anybody wants a free copy of the book, either go onto my website or I've got six or seven copies here, just come up and, and, and take one. Um, the core content of this book, uh, it's been out for quite a few years, been updated a few times, is the seven biggest mistakes. So if you want to know what the other four are, uh, they're, they're, they're in the book and you can have it free, free of charge. Okay? Um, so as I say, we've got over a thousand um, professional let HMO properties. Um, we do them out fully furnished to a high standard. Um, our average tenants are between sort of 21 and 40 years of age. They're working, they're not students, nothing against students. Um, but I was a student once and when the first time I left home, I wanted to go out and party and you know, wasn't too concerned about where I was living and what state I was keeping the property in. Um, so working professional tenants, all bills included, um, all furnitures included, and, um, and we've run for the last decade at between 96 and 98% occupancy on that portfolio all over the UK. Okay, so very, very high level of occupancy with what we do. Very, very high. I'll show you some numbers in a minute in terms of how the, how the financials play out. And I mentioned, you know, some of the other things that we do. Um, just as, a, as an aside, if anybody doesn't know about this, I feel it's my responsibility to let you know. Um, in 2016, I took the government to the High Court, took the tax man to the High Court over a tax. Has anybody heard of Section 24? Section 24? Surely more than you have heard of that. No. Okay. Does anybody own buy to let properties with a mortgage on it? few of you okay fine so if you've got any clients or you meet anybody that owns properties in an individual name and they have a mortgage on it um, then likelihood is they will be affected by section 24 all right um, it's basically a uh, change of the accounting principles on mortgage interest okay and for some people if you've got fairly large portfolio and quite a lot of mortgages on them it's going to affect you quite seriously to the tune of tens of thousands of pounds in terms of increasing your tax bill um, 
So we teamed up with uh, our barrister was um, Cherie, um, Cherie Blair, Tony Blair's wife, which was quite interesting from a political irony point of view, having a l former Labour Prime Minister's wife suing a Conservative government on behalf of landlords. Um, got us quite a lot. I was on BBC TV and Sky and ITV and in all the newspapers and that kind of thing. But if you're not aware of it or you're in um, buy to let or a state agency or letting agency, um, then you have a responsibility, I think, to your clients to, to, to know about this. Right? So just Google the tenant tax. There's a whole kind of website that will explain it. Unfortunately, we lost the court case. Um, I wouldn't recommend taking to the government to high court any anytime soon. It's quite painful. It took a lot of time. It cost about two hundred thousand um, pounds, but it was it was good in terms of raising. I met the chancellor. I met the housing minister. I you know got in at sort of fairly senior levels of government to have a debate about how I think the government are royally screwing up the property market at the moment, both for tenants and landlords. So um, we'll see what comes up in the budget in a couple of weeks' time. Um, so, mistake number one, really four mistakes, buying the wrong property, the wrong location, the wrong time and the wrong price. Um, to give you an, an indication, the first house I bought was a, an HMO out on Magna Road near, um, near Wimborne, between Bournemouth and Poole. Um, it's fine, you know, it kind of does its job, but I didn't really know what I was doing um, and I wouldn't buy that house again. Conversely, a couple of years later, three years later, I bought another house on Older Road that has eight bedrooms and it makes me about £11,000 a year more profit from rental income. And the only difference was I knew what to buy versus what, what not to buy, okay? But you could, you know, you can buy the wrong property, wrong location, wrong time and wrong price. So that's kind of common sense. So one of the things, mistake number two, is not protecting against the downside. Because I lost my house, that had quite a dramatic uh, impact on my uh, way of thinking as a business person, property investor, as an entrepreneur. So I always think about now what can go wrong. You know, we've just seen interest rates go up very recently. Um, the governor said in the next, two year, uh, next three years, you can expect another two uh, interest rate rises. So we're probably, um, it's rare actually that Governor of Bank of England actually comes out and makes a prediction as to what's going to happen, but he wanted to stabilize and calm the, calm the markets. So we're probably looking at a three quarter percent to one percent rise um, by his predictions over the next over the next three years. So people can factor that into their plans. So interest rates can go up. You can get bad tenants. Um, it's all these things. Property values can go down. So when I started building my portfolio, I assumed all of that was going to happen that the value of what I was going to buy was going to go down, that interest rates were going to go up, that taxes were going to go up, that I would have bad tenants, and all of those sorts of things. So when I looked at development or buying property to flip it, um, I just saw all of those things as quite risky. Um, and actually, I defaulted to um, the sort of buy to let. And this is an example. This is an actual six bedroom house that we have in Poole. Okay, just off the Ashley Road. Um, purchase price of 300,000, about 50,000 pound to reconfigure it internally. That produces fairly consistently 3,600 pound a month rental income. If that was rented to a fam family on a single occupancy basis, we're bringing about 1,000 pound a month. Okay, so it just shows you the difference. You take the same asset, you reconfigure it, you rent it in a different way. You know, it is more sophisticated, it is a professional investment strategy, but you're getting three times as much rental income. Monthly cost, the mortgage, the bills, the expenses, that's geared to 75% uh, loan to value. So it's got a mortgage, um, paying the mortgage costs on there, the bills, all of the running costs associated with that property. So you're making a gross profit of £1,400 a month from one buy to let property, an annual, annualised gross profit of nearly £17,000 a year. Okay? And if you think that's the best one, that's actually a below average property today. Um, typically a house in our portfolio would make about £20,000 a year profit just one buy to let after all, after all your costs. All right? And that's what's unique about our model. That's why we've become the fastest growing franch premium franchise in UK history, okay? because we've, we've systemized that and we help people find the houses, refurb them and rent them out and follow that model. Um, and then we target a 10% return on capital. So when I sort of talk about we own hotels and we own development sites around the area, we will only buy things that we know we can rent out so we're not in a rush to get planning permission. So we can take five years, 10 years, and we're making 10% on our money on an ongoing basis anyway, all right? So we're very, we hate risk, really, really hate risk. So assume everything's gonna go wrong, make sure you've got your income coming in, and that's a great way to, so whatever, you know, whatever it is for you, if you're considering or you do invest in property, how do you protect, protect against the downside? 
And then mistake number three, which I think is actually the most important one, which is not standing on the shoulders of giants. And what do I mean by that? It's about learning from other people. I just see, you know, I met somebody a little while ago, this property investor, had a portfolio. He's like, I've been doing, I've got four buy to lets. I've been doing buy to let for 30 years. Um, and I'm like, no, you haven't, mate. You've been doing buy to let for one year. You've just repeated that 30 times over. You know, it's actually about learning from other people and having mentors. And I'm a great believer in, you know, as with Matt talked about, I'd done some mentoring with Matt when he first came to me for a job um, to be recruited. He said, I want to start my own business. I'd like my own recruitment consultancy. And it's like, well, come and work for us, you know, prove yourself and we'll help incubate your business and help you launch the company. And that's what he did a few years ago. So all of those guys, Buffett's, the Zuckerberg's, the Gates, even Ed Sheeran, you know, all of these people behind them, not just one mentors, but multiple mentors. So a question for you to go away and, and think about who are your mentors? You know, who do you have as mentors? Do you have mentors today? Have you had mentors in the past? And who could be your mentors moving forward? Okay. Um, and then there's a, a quote. This guy did a study. You have a 67% chance of becoming the average of the people you spend most time with. Okay, so if you think about that, who do you actually spend most time with? And I always suggest you put your family to one side, because I'm not, you know, it's quite easy for a husband or wife to, to judge, oh, actually, I need to get rid of my wife. Um, and, you know, I'm a dad, and this is my, one of my, my youngest son, who's Jude, who's eight years of age, and it's like, I'm struggling to justify the return on investment of my eight-year-old son, so I've got to kick him out of my network. <laughs> so I suggest you put your family to one side and just think about it in a professional context, but it's very true. You know, a lot of, a lot of people that send their kids to private school, yes, they want a better education, but it's actually the peer group, who they're going to associate with. A lot of you might have got jobs or done deals in business where it's the people you know that have been the difference that made the difference. Okay, so make a conscious choice. If I, when I mentor people and speak to most people about this, it's like, well, I've got some old school friends, I've got people that I used to work with, I've got you know, guys that I play some sport with. Um, we don't necessarily make a conscious choice about our network, and it's something I'd encourage you to do because it's definitely one of the ways you can fast track um, your success, whatever that looks like to you. So, in summary, don't buy the wrong property in the wrong location, the wrong time, and the wrong price. Um, protect against your downside, assume everything's going to go wrong, and then how are you going to fare once you've stress tested it? And then find mentors and think about the people in your network. Okay? Um, and finally, don't copy my biggest mistake that cost me lots of money. And this is what it was, not buying shares in Purple Bricks in 2013. And I could have. And I met the guys that started it. And I was sitting down in a um, hotel in Southampton. We were talking there. You know, and Matt had the same, same opportunity. And both of us said no at the time. We looked at the proposal. We were like, oh, those numbers look a bit racy. Um, you know, it's quite a competitive market, all of those sorts of reasons. So I could have got in at $7 million. Uh, I believe you uh, checked on the stock market last night. It's currently valued at 1.1 billion. Um, that's a 15,000% return on investment over that time frame. If I'd have just put in 20 grand, 20 grand, <laughs> 3.1 million pounds profit before tax. So on that depressing note, <laughs> I will uh, thank you very much for listening and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Um, what are you doing at the moment? Because you said protecting the downside. Yeah. There's significant uncertainty with everything in terms of the political context and sure. I think in the EU, etc. Are yeah. you doing anything specifically new that you wouldn't have done previously to sort of plan for that? Yeah, I think the, I mean, it's a, it's a great point. So we've got Brexit coming up, we've had interest rate rises, we've got all the political uncertainty. Is, you know, is Corbyn and the Labour government going to get in? They're talking about rent controls, all, all of those sorts of things. Um, for me, the fundamentals are, um, you know, buying the right property, having that income, having that, you know, that, that's what we focus on. Now, I know some of you, there's a lot of developers here today um, that are not planning, you know, buying right, getting planning, developing and selling, selling for a profit. It's a different strategy. My niche is investing. I don't talk about what I don't know about. I'm not a property developer. I'm a property investor. Um, so when I look to invest, I look to invest for income and I look for um, the fundamentals. So the fundamentals buy the right property in the right location. We've got a very detailed process that we do for that. You know, I didn't just wander into this and think, oh, I'm going to do HMOs. You know, I've seen the TV show Friends. I don't want to do student letting. I placed an advert in the Bournemouth Echo 
before I even bought a property, before I even had offered on a property, just testing the market. Beautiful rooms to rent in Bournemouth and Paul, um, all bills included from £80 a week, cleaner, gardener, uh, you know, like-minded people call Steve. And I got 104 inquiries to 150 quid advert in the back of the Echo. So for me, that was my kind of um, customer research. I then went to view 20 rooms that landlords were offering to see how I was treated, you know, I was treated like the scum of the earth. It still amazes me today how in, in buy to let, you know, I can go into McDonald's, not that I do by the way, um, but I can go into McDonald's and buy a one pound burger and a, and a portion of chips and get better service for that and get treated better as a customer than I do, you know, if I'm a tenant dealing with sometimes a private landlord, you know. Where do you work? What's your job? Why are you moving? Give me your reference. I'm like, sorry, I'm, if I was a tenant, I'd be paying you six, seven hundred pounds a month and signing a six month agreement, you know, to thousands of pounds worth of income and you're treating me like the scum of the earth. So we give a good quality product um, at an affordable price and we just make sure we've got the, got the income coming in. So, you know, I'm not too personally not too worried about Brexit from a property market point of view, simply because if you look at the migration figures and the population figures, we've gone up in the last four years from 62 million to 65 million people now live in England. Um, and that's projected to increase by another 5 million. So even though we might not have so many workers coming in from Central and Eastern Europe, it's the old corny frame, they're not making, you know, saying they're not making any more land, we live on an island, all of those sorts of things. But the, the days for me of the vanilla buy to let, the amateur landlord, buy a flat, get a mortgage, rent it out to a couple, break even or make a minimal profit, that for me is a risky strategy. Those days have gone where the market's just going to kind of go like that. It's income and then you can sleep soundly at night. If the, you know, my portfolio, six million quid, went down by 15% in 2008 when the property market corrected. I wasn't jumping with, you know, jumping with glee, but I had a six figure income in terms of profit coming in from it. So you can ride through storms if you, it's a lack of cash, a lack of cash and a lack of cash flow that kills most businesses. So I'm, I'm kind of, you know, bullish about the future, but as long as you've got the right strategy. Yes. How do you get on with getting, getting the HMO licences because um, Depends in which particular areas. Um, we, we see that sometimes as an advantage. So if you, if you look at where HMO licensing came from, it actually came from a group of NIMBYs, you know, not in my backyard, getting together uh, and basically saying we live, the area we live in has now been taken over by students. And, and that was what they call it studentification. So the HMO licensing and planning to the Article 4 planning change came from that. We're not doing students. So we've got HMOs um, and we get planning for them in areas where there is an Article 4 or you do have quite strict licensing because we educate the council to say we're not doing students. We're providing quality housing that's affordable for key workers and young working people i.e. the labour force that your town or area needs. In a lot of areas we, we get approval, um, but there's some area like Milton Keynes is actually quite anti HMOs of any, of any description. Blackpool is another one. Um, so for the most part we see it as an opportunity, um, but if, you if you're doing student letting in those types of areas then yeah, you're really going to struggle so to get how planning. Much would you budget then when you go in to see a property thinking, well, it hasn't got a licence, I want it, I can see it's a viable property. Yeah. How much would you budget I mean, for us, the license is, doesn't add additional cost. We've always been higher than licensing standards. Yeah, so it's not like we're trying to scrimp and save. We've always spent, you know, our average refurb is about 60 grand per property. And that to, includes getting the license. And that includes getting the, yeah, the license is a small element of it, but it includes that as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for listening and uh, enjoy the rest of the day.